Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be uh, welcoming Brian Armstrong today here for a fireside chat with uh, our colleagues Subhashish Banerjee and uh, Subodh Sharma. Um, uh, I'll quickly introduce uh, all the three participants of this chat. Uh, Brian, uh, Brian Armstrong, as you perhaps all know, is uh, co-founder and chief executive officer of Coinbase. Founded in 2012, Coinbase is building the crypto, crypto economy, a more fair, accessible, efficient, and transparent financial system enabled by crypto. Coinbase serves over 73 million verified users, 10,000 institutions, and 18,000 ecosystem partners in over 100 countries. In April 2021, Coinbase listed publicly on NASDAQ as Coin. In April 2020, Brian committed Coinbase to pledge 1%, dedicating 1% of Coinbase profits, equity, and employee time towards charitable activities that leverage the power of crypto to help people around the world. In June 2018, he founded GiveCrypto.org, a nonprofit with a mission to financially empower people by distributing cryptocurrency globally. Brian also personally signed the Giving Pledge, committing the majority of his wealth to charitable causes throughout his lifetime. Before founding Coinbase, Brian served as a software engineer at Airbnb, where he focused on fraud prevention. Before Airbnb, Brian founded and was CEO of universitytutor.com, an online tutoring directory and a subsidiary of Johnson Educational Technologies, LLC. Brian also previously served as a consultant for the Enterprise Risk Management Division at Deloitte & Touche, LLP. Brian has a BA in Computer Science and Economics and an MS in Computer Science from Rice University. Please join me in welcoming Brian Armstrong to I today. Subhashi Banerjee is a professor of computer science at Ashoka University. He is on leave from the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at IIT Delhi, where he has held, where he has held the Ministry of Urban Development, Microsoft, and Narain Gupta Chair Professorships. He was the head of the Department of Computer Science at IIT Delhi between 2004 to 2007, and head of the Computer Center between 2009 and 2014. Subhashi is also associated with the School of Public Policy and the Center for Transportation Research and Injury Prevention at IIT Delhi. Subhashish's primary area of research are computer vision and machine learning, with a special emphasis on geometric algorithms. He has been on the editorial boards of the International Journal of Computer Vision and Computers and Graphics, and has published in leading journals and conferences. He has also worked extensively on design of computing and networking infrastructure and IT services, and in developing the supercomputing infrastructure at IIT Delhi, which is the second largest in the country. He has been an academic visitor to several universities and research laboratories all over the world. Recently, he has also developed an interest in policy issues, digitization, and society, including digital identity, electronic voting, data and privacy protection, and fairness and reliability of machine learning algorithms. Subhashish graduated in electrical engineering from Jadavpur University in 1982 and did his master's and PhD from the Indian Institute of Science in 84 and 89, respectively. Welcome, Subhashish. Subodh Sharma is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at IIT Delhi. He currently holds the Pankaj Gupta Chair in Privacy and Decentralization. Subodh is also associated with the School of Public Policy at IIT Delhi. Subodh's primary research areas are formal verification and software engineering with a special focus on automated reliability analysis of parallel and distributed systems via program analysis, model checking, and program, programming language solutions. His recent research investigations have been in the area of system security, data privacy, and blockchains. Prior to joining IIT Delhi, Subodh has spent time at the University of Oxford as a postdoctoral researcher and a visiting researcher at Chennai Mathematical Institute. He obtained his master's and PhD from the University of Utah in computer science. Welcome, Subodh. Um, 
with everyone on stage, I welcome uh, you to now take this uh, discussion forward. Yeah, over to you, Subhashish and Subha. Welcome, Brian. Um, so, uh, at the outset, I must say that uh, we are all excited uh, to you know, hear about interesting things surrounding cryptocurrency from you. And we are truly uh, representing, most of our queries and questions would be uh, you know, representing student interests. Uh, and with that, I think we can get started. Um, so to the start off our fireside chat, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your early journey, uh, setting up Coinbase, the challenges that you faced, the factors that led to its success, where it is at right now. So you know, quite a few questions packed into one, but please take it. Yeah, well, I'm very excited to be here and um, so glad to have the opportunity to tell you a bit about the story and hopefully it's educational and you learn something from it. So the story of Coinbase goes back really to university where I was studying computer science, as you heard, and also economics. And I'd always thought about the power of technology to change the world. And I hoped that one day there would be some kind of technology trend that came along where I could, as an engineer, build something useful for the world that would improve it in some way. And it happened that in 2010, um, I read the Bitcoin white paper that came out, a research paper. You may be familiar with it. It was written by somebody that still is anonymous to this day. Nobody knows for sure who this person is. That They go by the name Satoshi Nakamoto. But it talked about this new decentralized protocol for creating value. And I, I read it one day in 2010. And I got excited about it. I didn't really understand it fully. I had to go reread it a few times, but it kicked off this journey for me. I couldn't stop thinking about it over the next six months and 12 months. And I eventually just started working on a prototype on nights and weekends. I had a job at another company, Airbnb. I was a software engineer there, but on nights and weekends, I would work on this prototype. And I, my idea at that time was very simple. It was that there's a new decentralized protocol that's been created here around Bitcoin, but the average person needs an easy way to use it. It's, it was very complicated. A lot of people who I talked to about it, they thought, oh, this will never work. You know, my, even some of my closest friends, they would tell me, this seems like a scam. You know, why would anybody ever use this? Um, but I, I, somehow it just captured my, my attention and my, my interest. And so I, on nights and weekends, I'd work on this prototype, which eventually became Coinbase. You know, I was lucky enough to um, apply to this incubator program called Y Combinator. They were the first people who really said, hey, maybe you're not crazy. Let's give you um, a small check. And if you want to quit your job and work on this, uh, you can go and do that. And so that was the genesis of Coinbase. You know, we, we almost died several times along the way. Starting a company is incredibly challenging. And I'm happy to talk more about that. But I think if you ask sort of what made Coinbase successful, and if I could boil it down to just a few things, I think one was that um, we were incredibly determined. So starting a company is just like moving from one setback to the next with enthusiasm. It never goes how you think it's going to go. There's somebody sues you, somebody quits the company, there's you know, co-founder disputes, there's bugs in your code, people try to hack into your thing and steal all the money and you can't raise money, more money. And you know, so there's an incredible amount of determination and perseverance that's required to build a company and, and just move through it no matter what the problem is. You know, I think another one was that we just captured a moment in time. There was a little bit of luck where this new technology had just emerged and 99% of people in the world looked at it and said, ah, oh, this is not interesting. It's a toy. It'll never be taken seriously as real money or to build a new financial system or to build new applications with Web3. And they dismissed it and they, they underestimated it. And so th there's definitely something very true about startups where, you know, you have to be early but right. Uh, if you you know if you wanted to start a cloud computing company today, for instance, it's probably a little bit too late to do that. There's already Microsoft and Amazon and Google in it. But at that time, starting what we started was was brand new. And and now, by the way, we're surrounded by opportunities. There's so many new things happening in crypto. Um, so there's a little bit of luck on the timing. We were incredibly determined, and I think that was probably. And, and then we we looked for the best people we could find to join the company. And along the way, we collected that group of really talented people. We held a very high bar, and that allowed us, I think, to with a little bit of luck, to eventually become successful. Yeah, thanks, uh, uh, thanks, Brian. Um, it's interesting you uh, spoke about um, Web three, and um, there's a lot of buzz around, you know, these terms such as Web three, metaverse, 
Web3 playing a role as a, a you know a foundational role on which Web you know the next generation internet would be based on and so on and so forth. Um, could you take us through these notions and how you and Coinbase uh, view them uh, in changing the landscape altogether? Yeah, sure. So a lot of people, when they first look at cryptocurrency, they, they hear about Bitcoin. And they think of it as kind of like digital gold, which is a good analogy, I think. Bitcoin is a little bit like digital gold. The this, this supply of it is guaranteed to be scarce. There'll never be more than 21 million Bitcoin. It's decentralized, so there's no central bank of Bitcoin. Just like gold, that it's totally decentralized around the world. And they think that that's what cryptocurrency is. But it's turned out that cryptocurrency has become much more than just digital gold. So yes, it is, it is Bitcoin as digital gold. It's also a new kind of financial system. So people are building uh, stable currencies uh, with, with cryptocurrency. They're building decentralized borrowing and lending marketplaces, um, decentralized exchanges. If you look at things like DeFi and remittances are being done with crypto and commerce is being done with crypto. And so it is really like not only a new type of money, like di like uh, digital gold, it's also a new type of financial system. Then going beyond that, it's, it's even more. It's actually a new type of application platform. It's a new way that people are building applications. And this is what is meant by Web3. So if you were to break it down, um, you know, Web1 was the early days of the internet. It was kind of like uh, people were recreating newspapers on the internet, almost like you could read this static page of text or images, right? Then in Web 2, it became read and write, you know, so you got JavaScript and uh, you could build these dynamic applications. Now, with Web 3, it's not only read and write, it's also own. So you can own the digital items um, that are provably scarce in these new types of applications that are being built. And that, what, you know, what does that mean? Well, it could mean that in the metaverse, you know, you can own digital items. Uh, NFTs have gotten incredibly popular recently with artists and, and folks creating digital content that you can own. It also means that if you want to create a new type of community online, like imagine if you were to create um, Reddit or Twitter or a marketplace like Uber or Airbnb today, you might issue a token and uh, allow people in that community to actually own a piece of the value. You know, like on, on Reddit, everybody is earning upvotes, but it's they're, they're kind of fake internet points. It's just an entry in a centralized database. What if the people contributing all that value to those communities could actually own a piece of it? That would be really exciting. Um, and then, you know, it goes beyond that. People are creating new types of digital identities with, you know, ENS is one of the examples there, or new types of voting and governance systems with DAOs, which are decentralized autonomous organizations. So it's starting to look like, really, cryptocurrency is kind of like the next internet. It's much bigger than just digital money. It's actually the way that people are going to build most applications with software um, in the future, I believe. You know, I think, just to give you one more example, and then I'll turn it back. That, you know, when, in the early 2000s, people, this, this phrase became common, the dot-com startups, right? And you all probably have heard of dot-com startups. Well, now you don't need to say dot-com startup because every startup uses the internet, right? And I think the same thing is going to be true in five or 10 years. You won't need to say crypto startup, of which there are now hundreds and probably thousands. You'll just say startup because every startup is using the internet and crypto and probably machine learning and <laughs> other things. And so it is becoming the new way all, most I should say, applications are going to be built in the future. Uh, I have a follow-up question on that and this was specifically asked by a couple of students. Um, uh, so so if, if we just stick to Web3, uh, according to you, uh, other than the financial uh, domain, which other domains do you think would see, you know, a rapid growth in uh, forthcoming years, based on Web three as, as a basis? Yeah, so Web three is is getting a lot of traction in, in many different areas. So um, one of them is, I think, social media. There's going people are recreating new types of social media applications that are totally decentralized. Um, so you you know your data doesn't have to be stored by Facebook or, or Twitter or something like that, or it could even be censored, you know, by those by those companies. Another one is gaming, right? So a lot of the gaming startups that are being funded by top venture capital firms now have a crypto component to it, where the digital items in the game are being used. Um, another one is around um, identity systems, and when you have identi identity, a digital identity, you can also attach uh, reputation to that, credit scores, you know, things like that. Um, I think even the way that companies and organizations are, are being created, that's 
happening in Web3 with DAOs, and you're seeing, um, it's almost like the new uh, C corporation, or, or probably the equivalent here, but it's almost like, um, yeah, it, even you could imagine uh, voting and governance for different types of entities, like with physical land in certain areas. Um, like a, how would a, a community, um, a planned community somewhere actually decide what to build and what to invest in? It could all happen on the blockchain with a DAO. So those are just some of the examples. And of course, artwork with NFTs, right? There's, you know, songs and um, videos. and So anyway, it, it goes on and on. Those are some of the areas that are getting traction. Thanks. Uh, so uh, we heard that Coinbase has committed to, uh, you know, give one percent of its profits uh, for CSR activities, and um, that's commendable. Uh, so there was a related question on that: that uh, uh, you know, Coinbase's mission is to create um, economic freedom in the world, and uh, I would uh, like to understand uh, how do cryptocurrencies can play a role in achieving that economic freedom. Yeah, so economic freedom is a really is a topic I'm very passionate about, and you can go read about it on Wikipedia. It's a term that economists use, and it, it really is a composite metric. Economic freedom is, it, they look at different countries around the world, and they look at a composite metric of different things. And it looks at things like, um, is the, are property rights enforced? You know, can people keep the things that they have, that belong to them, or are they taken away from them? Is there a stable currency? Is there free trade enabled? How easy is it to start a business or to join a company that you want to work for? And so you could think of it broadly as um, how how much friction is there in the economy to go people to go create and build new things, or is it difficult for them? There could be, you know, inflation or corruption or bribery or just a lot of bureaucracy, and that's so that's kind of what economic freedom seeks to measure. And one of the core insights that Coinbase is founded on is this idea that cryptocurrency is a very unique tool, uh, really an invention, that could increase economic freedom in the world. Now think about it, if, if you wanted to go build good financial infrastructure in all the countries of the world, um, that would be a very difficult project. You know, there's a lot of uh, local relationships in every country and local rules, and, but for the first time with cryptocurrency, we can almost inject good financial infrastructure into countries all over the world just with, as long as everybody has a smartphone and internet access, they can get access to um, stable currency, you know, free trade. They can have property rights enforced. That's a really big one because, um, you know, crypto enables things like, um, a, you know, like a brain wallet, they would call it, or a self-custodial wallet. And if you can just remember 12 words in your head, you can store your own wealth in a way that it can't be taken from you. Um, I mean, look at people right today, recently in Ukraine, for instance, there's refugees kind of fleeing the country and... Um, they sometimes can't take their wealth with them and you know th there's all kinds of issues like that historically that have been major um, barriers to people building better lives for themselves so I, I believe that cryptocurrency plus now that smartphones and the internet have become ubiquitous means that the next generation of people they're gonna have good financial infrastructure and good property rights all over the world uh, regardless of uh, what the local rules or government or society are doing that's good or bad uh, I think it also requires adoption of the technology and like you said, so long as people have smartphones and internet connectivity, uh, it should be much simpler. Uh, but in a country like India, there, yeah, um, that is also one of the things that we have to look at. Um, There's actually some interesting, a lot of people have looked at what's sort of the last mile solution. You know, if, if you're in a location that doesn't have good internet connectivity, can your phone, can it communicate peer to peer with the other phone? Um, and then it, when one of the devices eventually gets internet connectivity, it re relays to the blockchain. But that, that's an interesting, the last mile is a very interesting area of, of research. Uh, so blockchain, uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, so this is uh, the key technology that's been powering cryptocurrencies and Web3 um, uh, excitements and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so just for our audience, uh, blockchain uh, technology or blockchain as a principle has got two, very quickly uh, for our uh, you know, I'll just summarize the concept. It has got two uh, main aspects to it. One is uh, an immutable, publicly visible ledger uh, where you can only uh, add data to it. You cannot modify or delete data that has been added in the past. And the other important aspect, which is uh, the most crucial aspect of blockchain, is the fact that the data is um, added to this ledger 
via a consensus mechanism. So this consensus is pre uh, pre decided, and uh, uh, you know this works uh, correctly under the assumption that majority of the participants of the network are honest. Um, and, and and we would like to uh, sort of understand uh, from you. Um, so for this blockchain uh, to work properly, um, why? I mean, of course, it's working properly, but uh, why immutability and consensus are so critical in the success of cryptocurrencies as a financial instrument? Yeah. Well, there, so historically in financial services, there have always been uh, what are called trusted intermediaries, right? So if I, you know, if I <laughs> if I have a dollar bill or you know rupees, um, and I want to physically a piece of cash, like if I give it to one person, you kind of know in the physical world that I can't give you the same bill to another person. Um, but in the digital world, historically, it's always been easy to make copies of things. You know, if I have a, if I have a photo on my phone, I could send the same photo to 100 people or 1,000 people, and it's really hard to prove that I, I have the photo, but you don't have the photo. That was really one of the core innovations that Bitcoin created was this idea of digital scarcity. And it said, you know, if I have one of these digital items, I know that I'm the only one who has it. Nobody else can have it. It, it solved what's, what's called the double spending problem. And so they did that with um, this consensus mechanism. And um, it does require, you know, the majority of participants on the network. It's actually not the number of participants, but it's the majority of the hashing power it has to be uh, good actors, 51% um, or more. And so far, there's been enough good people in the world who want to <laughs> see cryptocurrency grow and the incentives are aligned where the people doing this, um, this consensus algorithm with mining, cryptocurrency mining, you know, they get rewards for mining. And so there's an incredible amount of computing power now backing up the, the Bitcoin network in a way that even some very determined, very well-resourced uh, actor, you know, st state actor even, could have a very hard time trying to take down Bitcoin to try to get more than 51% of the network. Um, so this consensus, we're sort of talking multiple topics. I guess the consensus algorithm was very important to eliminate this idea of trusted intermediaries. Because if, you, if everything has to run through a trusted intermediary, you tend to get um, monopolies, oligopolies, you get less innovation, you get high fees. And this is one of the reasons that um, you know, payments have not innovated as quickly as other areas. So I guess I'll give you just an, anal an analogy here and then we can <laughs> to, to wrap up. So think about pre-internet, how did people publish information? You had te uh, newspapers, radio, television, right? And those each had kind of centralized gatekeepers for each of those because it was expensive to have a television station or a newspaper, you had to print, right? And so if you wanted to get a message out, you had to go to the head of this newspaper or te television station, and it was a limited thing. And so the internet, by being a decentralized protocol, democratized publishing of information, it brought down the cost by an order of magnitude, but it made it so really anybody, um, even an average person, could, could create a website or host something on their computer. And so the decentralized nature of the internet was incredibly powerful for that democratizing force. Cryptocurrency is really doing the same thing, but with, with money and different forms of value and, and now even other forms of data and artwork and things, where it's, it's democratizing the transmission of value. You no longer have to go through uh, a centralized gatekeeper like a bank or a credit card processing company or something like that, which might have their own incentive to, um, to have delays or cross-border issues or high fees. Now, I think India is almost an exception in this case because with, with UPI and everything, I mean, honestly, that was a huge innovation and a step in the right direction. Most companies, or not, not, not most companies, most countries in the world have had nowhere near that amount of success. I mean, even in the United States. Yeah, China with WeChat, of course, there's privacy issues there, right? Um, but I think in the US, for instance, it still takes three to five business days to, to do a bank transfer, whereas it should be instant and free, right? There's no reason why it should take that long. And so that is the promise of cryptocurrency, is it's gonna bring this more um, efficient, also probably more private um, financial infrastructure to not just one country, but every country in the world. It works cross-border, it works globally, hopefully, um, the privacy issues are eliminated. That would be an amazing thing for freedom and growth of the whole world. Uh, so we'll talk about decentralization and centralization uh, a little bit more uh, from a moment from now. But um, uh, so, uh, so with regards to consensus, um, 
there is this general anxiety that, uh, well, um, so if, if you look at Bitcoin networks, there are only few mining pools. So is it truly leading to decentralization uh, or, um, and is it safe or there is a possibility of collusion even under uh, such a setting? Yeah, so the mining pools are something I am somewhat concerned about as well. I do think that um, cryptocurrency mining is very decentralized and there's other forms of um, decentralization in terms of who can, you know, who is issuing new code updates, what exchanges are supporting different cryptocurrencies and different forks of the network. So there's sort of a, it's almost like different branches of government. There's, you know, exchanges, there's the core developers, there's also the miners. So there's various forms. I think the centralization of mining is a little bit of a concern with those mining pools. Um, and I guess the point I would make here is that decentralization is not a binary yes or no, it's a spectrum. And so, you know, we always have to think about trade-offs in computer science and real, really all engineering. And cryptocurrency is no different, where if you want to increase the decentralization, you tend to have trade-offs where you have to give up um, maybe how scalable the network is. Or for instance, if you want to make this the Bitcoin network where any node, anybody in the world could run a node on their own laptop, which is sort of one of the goals of, cryptocurrency, of Bitcoin specifically, um, you know, you need to make sure that the, it, the scalability issues are there, where it can run in that there. Uh, you you want to make it available to anybody to run their own mining software. So anyway, I, sort of a, not the most clear answer, but yes, I'm concerned about it. I think that there's a lot more research needs to go into scaling of blockchains, decentralizing blockchains, finding the best trade-offs from an engineering point of view. And I hope that's something that some of the people here in the audience and, and on the video can help with. Thank you. Uh, so, Subhashish, do you want to take over? And um, yeah, that was, a, that was a very good introduction. Um, so, uh, you know, um, when it comes to cryptocurrencies, and uh, there's a the political economy of it is a is a, is a concern amongst uh, students and people like us, uh, and in general. So, when you talk about centralization and decentralization, I think that the crux is there. And uh, we are used to central banks, central banks stabilizing the currency, so they control the supply. Uh, and um, also, you know, they change lending rates uh, and the liquidation rates, uh, so that, um, you know, both the inflation and their deflation uh, is sort of controlled by a central bank. Now, when you look at a cryptocurrency, such as a Bitcoin, right, the supply rate is very, very determined, the specs is very predictable, uh, uh, so you're halving every year. Uh, the number of coins that can be mined. But there's a concern on the demand side. You know, there's a certain liquidation, um, there'll be price volatility and there's nobody controlling it. So why is decentralization such a, such a desirable feature? Well, a lot to unpack there. So um, I'll start by talking for a minute just about the volatility of Bitcoin, because I think you're correct that central banks around the world do try to mitigate the, the swings of volatility. Um, so Bitcoin is not intended to be entirely uh, stable. There's actually another category of cryptocurrencies called stable coins, which are intended to be entirely stable, which is valuable for commerce and contracts and, and things like that. Bitcoin is really trying to be more like digital gold, um, which, you know, there's no central bank for gold, um, but the, finite, the supply of gold in the Earth's crust, you know, is finite. And so this is an important point, which is that cryptocurrency is actually many different things. There's Bitcoin, which is trying to be digital gold. There's like a commodity. Um, there's some stable coins, which are trying to be more like currencies. There's even some um, cryptocurrencies, which are trying to be like securities or stocks, like helping people raise money for a company. There's other cryptocurrencies, which are like artwork, like NFTs. So this is one thing, um, it's confusing for people to come into cryptocurrency because they think, what is this thing? It's, but it's actually, it can be, there's many types of cryptocurrencies now that are trying to be different things. Um, let's see, going back to your question about, um, it wasn't about consensus you were asking about. Uh, centralization. Centralization, yeah. Um, so okay. for, for example, if you come to say currency, you know, yeah. stable coin, um, can it really work without, um, can it really work without somebody playing a stabilization role? Because, uh, you know, who controls inflation, who controls deflation, uh, uh, who controls the lending rates and so on and so forth? Can market determine this automatically? Uh, that's the question. I believe yes. Um, 
So it's, it's like asking, you know, well, the internet is decentralized. So how does it work? Uh, there's nobody more to sort of moderating it. There are sort of standards bodies that people that come and try, they, they try to meet at conferences several times per year. But um, so far, you know, De DeFi, which is sort of like the decentralized internet-based version of some of these marketplaces, it has worked. You know, gold has no central planning, but it has worked. So I don't think that, like Bitcoin is not gonna be as stable as some fiat currencies, but I do think it will be similar to a profile of like gold over time. Let me just say a comment on, I guess, centralization versus decentralization. Decentral decentralization is not better in every way, right? There are, there's trade-offs to everything. So I think the pros of decentralization is that, you know, there isn't any one group of people in charge. Because sometimes when <laughs> there is a group that's in charge, they, the, something will be manipulated for their own benefit, right? If you look at history, there's been thousands of um, fiat currencies over time, and generally when they're, they become decoupled from hard assets, they lead to inflation. That's just been the history of fiat money, right? Um, and so decentralization has a very nice property, which is that there is no small group of people who can manipulate it. That's why people trust Bitcoin and they believe that it has long-term potential. Now, the trade-off, there's a downside to decentralization as well, which is, you know, um, you, you mentioned the volatility of Bitcoin, so there's not a central bank moderating it, it's more like gold. The other downside of decentralization is that it's harder to upgrade these protocols, right? Look at like the HTTP protocol um, has only been upgraded, I think, maybe like once or twice in the last 25 years. It's very slow to upgrade because there's nobody in charge. And so it's kind of, it's a chaos almost of like, er, how do you slowly get these upgrades? Or remember the like IPv4 went to the IB, IPv6 standard. You know, it's been taking like 20 years or something to upgrade. They didn't do the chicken. Right, <laughs> right. Um, and so if you look at a, a central, or look at messaging protocols or something like that, right? I mean. WeChat or WhatsApp, they're, they, they're able to very quickly add features, emojis and um, you know, videos and voice notes and all these things because it's a, more of a centralized protocol. So the, de the downside of decentralized protocols is they tend to be almost like frozen in time. They're very slow to upgrade. Um, Ethereum is working to upgrade to Ethereum 2 and they're making progress towards that, but it is taking a very long time. So it, it has resilience as it's decentralized, but it moves slower. So the other concern that, uh, that many people have, and so there are some student questions as well, that um, you know there are only certain kinds of uh, goods and services um, that you can buy with the cryptocurrency right now, even with stable coin. So you can't buy everyday product. I can't buy toothpaste in India, for example. So, um, so given that scenario, um, how will price stabilization or price fixation and determination happen with respect to the fiat currencies? Or do you foresee a situation where fiat currency will be completely replaced someday by, by this kind of a cryptocurrency? Yeah, so I don't think cryptocurrencies are going to replace fiat currencies. Stable coins, actually many of the stable coins are actually a digitized version of fiat, fiat currencies themselves. So there's, you know, digital rupee, digital dollar, and... Digital rupee is the finance minister. Yeah. So the details are a little unclear. Right. So I think many countries are going to go build, they're called, you know, central bank digital currencies. China is probably the farthest ahead on this. They've actually been working on uh, digital yuan for probably six years at this point, and it's actually live in several major cities in China. People are actually using it already. Um, the U.S. is a little behind on this, I think. I've spoken with people there in Treasury, and they have some interest in it, but there's very little work happening. The private market in the United States has created uh, stable coins like USD coin. And so I think in the US it may end up being that the uh, private market solutions will become regulated and blessed. Those will become the, the central bank digital currencies. Uh, that's a guess, a theory. I think that you know India probably should have a central bank digital currency. That would probably be a good thing. It would improve um, you know the ability for people to use uh, rupee in low friction ways and in more international commerce. It would, it would help India grow as a financial hub. By the way, there's also stable coins that are not central bank backed. They're actually, um, they attempt to use uh, various market dynamics to kind of stabilize the price using smart contracts, which is a whole 
fascinating field. So I hope that someday actually cryptocurrency will be used for commerce to buy toothpaste and all these things. I think that won't be the early use case. The early use case is happening more online in these like you know online games and communities and to buy NFTs. It's more like digitally native things where you want to participate in a global economy. Like if you you know if you want to sell your artwork or this online community have people from all over the world joining it. It's more, it's more fair and more equitable to use a digital currency because then you can have people from all over the world participate and it's not based on one country's currency. But eventually, I hope toothpaste and everything gets there um, with more use cases. Yes, so uh, do we have to consider inequity? You know, if you consider a country like India, uh, digital literacy is really, really low. You know, and uh, we are a welfare economy, so 70% of the people actually get their food to ration in this country. And, um, you know, so do you see any danger? Because there are only certain kind of um, goods and services that are available to through cryptocurrency. So promoting cryptocurrency, do you think that may cross a digital divide in the society? You know, some people left out, some people, uh, you know, uh, picketty kind of inequity. Do you see a possibility of an enemy? Well, I mean, one of the beautiful things about cryptocurrency is that it is accessible to everybody. Literally, if you just have a smartphone, which even today the poorest people in many places of the world have smartphones, uh, luckily, you know, the cost has come down enormously. So I do think it's actually quite accessible to all areas of society, um, high and low. Now, I would agree with you that a lot of the, um, you know, the early adopters are people, wealthy people are buying crypto as an investment, probably before less educated people. So I don't think cryptocurrency is going to solve wealth inequality, but I do think it helps in the sense that it's it's very much a leveling of the playing field, kind of like the internet leveled the playing field for publishing information. It made it, the cost came down by an order of magnitude, things like that. Now again, India is a little bit of an exception here because my understanding is that um, bank accounts have now become available to even the poorest people. UPI has been an amazing effort in this direction. So I, I you know, I think actually, the efforts by um, more centralized groups in India have actually made enormous strides here. What my hope is that you know those kind of benefits are really made available in every country of the world. It's not. Imagine if um, you know most of the countries in Africa or something had a, a system like UPI. That would be amazing for the world. So I think crypto may have more to offer in some other places. Um, that doesn't mean there's nothing to offer in India. I think that. Like the, again, this concept of the future of how applications are being built with social media and gaming and artwork and it, there's an enormous amount of innovation happening there. But in terms of like leveling the playing field, India has already done some amazing things. So UPI is completely amazing. You know, I have some uh, some some issues with the design. It could have been designed some other way. But as a social tool, it is it is a phenomenal tool. So the question then comes up. You know. Um, how is this digital currency, um, and our finance minister said that it will be blockchain based, uh, uh, there are no other details available, but um, how do you think that is different from the UPI which is already there, you know, in terms of transactions? So, uh, yeah, well the main difference is that it is a open standard that anybody in the world can interoperate with. So I think UPI has been enormously successful within India, but in terms of international commerce, it could be really powerful to put it on the blockchain. Um, thanks, and um, possibly, possibly some uh, privacy benefits too. UPI has a ma major privacy concern. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so um, you know, the, another round of question that comes up you know, regarding uh, centralization and control. So when it uh, is related to the mining pool question, hmm? um, and also, so so gold for example, is uh, valuable because it is scarce, once, and second, because there is a perceived demand. Right? Uh, people wear jewelry. They don't as yet wear uh, crypto certificates uh, in marriage parties, but, but, um, but crypto has a, a serious, serious demand among students and so on and, and everybody. Now, the scarcity part is a little uh, there's a little bit of concern. The scarcity comes with uh, proof of work, uh, you know, mining, the hashing for the work. Um, no, it looks like that, um, you know, if as you say that everybody could run uh, proof of work hashing protocol on their laptops, then the scarcity would go away a little bit. 
correct? The scarcity comes because I cannot really run out. You know, the assistant professor can't. The professor is not very far behind. Our salaries are low. So I really need a data center to be able to run it now, right? A massive GPU farm and so on and so forth. So in terms of that, as you said that um, everybody is able to run it. Is that true really? Because the scarcity requires that not everybody is able to run it, right? Um, not quite. So I think anybody can run a Bitcoin node, which is different than running a Bitcoin mining operation. Running a Bitcoin node can still be done on a really low-end computer, right? And of course, yeah, it's basically having visibility into all transactions happening on the network and being able to submit your own transactions, just like any you know large player. Um, and of course, by the way, there's also, of course, many applications, like Coinbase is just one of many, that would allow you, even if you don't want to run your own node, to be able to participate. Um, but Bitcoin mining, we're just talking about Bitcoin here for a moment, um, does require more infrastructure to be competitive. Now, you can run Bitcoin mining on your own laptop, but you're not going to be competitive. The, the price that you'll pay in electricity is probably more than you will earn. So that has become a specialized game of ASICs and custom hardware and data centers and building data centers in locations that have very inexpensive electricity. So um, it's not, again, the mining pools are the most centralized. Bitcoin mining is actually relatively decentralized. It's, there's major Bitcoin mining centers in every major country of the world. So it's not like one country who could unilaterally achieve 50% of the mining power or something like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I hope, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, so, uh, so that was my next question, that the moment you have a thing like proof of work, there's bound to be some amount of centralization because, um, so the question is that, uh, you know, where does it stand with respect to consensus? So we, do we really then have political decentralization? So they may be in different countries where they are probably people who think alike in, in many ways. So would you really say that uh, we would have political decentralization in, uh, in, in such mining? I think so, actually. There's, so Bitcoin mining is happening in countries that vehemently disagree with each other on all, most issues, but they, but they are all running Bitcoin nodes. You know, China has major ones, US, um, you know, Kazakhstan, like India. So it's hard, it's hard, you're hard pressed to find a country in the world that does not have some type of Bitcoin mining happening. It's actually, in some ways, it is what every country in the world can agree on is the blockchain. That's what's beautiful about it, is that it's, it's trusting the laws of math instead of the laws of men and women, you know? We can all agree on the laws of math and code, because those are more universal principles. You can't make two plus two equal five or something like that. And so China and the US may disagree on many issues, but they will always agree on what the balance is of, of every address in the, blo the Bitcoin blockchain. That's kind of a beautiful thing. Yes, so, um, you know, maybe, uh, so what goes on to the blockchain um, is a mathematical protocol, right? So there's a hash function, everybody can verify, every node can verify. Um, will it be possible ever to stop certain kind of transactions from happening? You know, for example, um, say Russia falls out of favor, let's say, right? Uh, and uh, can we restrict certain kind of, uh, can others gang up and restrict certain kind of, access to Russia, or you know, can those things happen, given that only a few can create blocks? Yeah, so the Bitcoin blockchain is, there's only one version of it globally, so everybody has to agree on that. But every, com every company that is a cryptocurrency company or using cryptocurrency in some way in every country around the world has to follow the laws of those countries. So this is a very, very important distinction. Um, you know, people have asked me, well, will Will Russia be, evade sanctions or something like that with cryptocurrency? And so far, the answer is no, because any kind of exchange inside Russia has to follow the laws of Russia. Any exchange inside India or the US has to follow the laws of those countries. And so they are all regulated financial service businesses, just like banks or, or other financial service companies. Um, so I think so far we haven't seen an issue in, in that direction. Um, but I, yeah, I, I hope that answers it. Um, so proof of work uh, probably has some other issues regarding environment, and I think Subodh found those questions, and lots of students too. Maybe Subodh. Yeah, so they are representative of 
you know, uh, the questions that we obtained from our students. And many of them wanted to know that, well, computer science is mostly about efficiency, um, and these systems uh, should be designed, uh, which should also be environmentally friendly, because we are moving, uh, collectively as a world, we are moving towards carbon neutral uh, places, carbon neutral cities, and so on and so forth. Um, and in that sense, uh, what are you? What are your views about the inherent energy inefficiencies in current day blockchain platforms, be it ETH 1.0 or Bitcoin? Yeah. So Bitcoin, that the proof of work, the the um, mining that we talked about, does use a lot of energy. There's no doubt about that. Um, now, I don't think that it's quite as bad as people think. One reason is that supposedly a lot of the mining energy is coming from renewable energy sources. So just using a lot of electricity is not necessarily a bad thing as long as more and more of it becomes uh, from renewable sources over time. Um, I think another important point to note here is that um, some of the cryptocurrencies are moving to new algorithms beyond proof of stake, like proof, or sorry, beyond proof of work to proof of stake which you know, Ethereum 2 is an example of that, and proof of stake is much more energy efficient. So I think ultimately it comes down to whether people believe that having blockchains and like Bitcoin are valuable in the world. You know, um, for instance, washing laundry with um, electric washers also uses a lot of electricity in the world, far more than Bitcoin. But um, if we believe having clean clothes is a good thing, it's probably worth spending some electricity on that and we can make energy generation more green over time, not uh, consuming less of it. And so I, I believe that having a decentralized global ledger for money is a very valuable thing for humanity too, so it's probably okay to use some electricity for that. Um, and I think sometimes we see people who really don't like Bitcoin for some other reason, but they're trying to make an environmental argument. So I think the industry has a responsibility to clean it up, but um, if we just use renewable energy, move to proof of stake, things like that, it, it's very solvable. What are your views on ETH 2.0? You're saying that I think ETH 2.0 is has moved, has consciously moved towards proof of stake, and um, and, and you earlier made a remark that uh, adoption of ETH 2.0 could take some time. Um, uh, you know, so so what are you, your views on it? How how quickly this adoption will happen? And, uh, yeah, well, can it play? So scaling blockchains, of which Ethereum 2.0 is uh, one example, is a very important effort, and I hope that um, more and more efforts go in that direction. We're trying to do some of that work at Coinbase as well. And it's a bit like, again, the internet. In the early days of the internet, we had dial-up modems, everything was very slow. This is part of the reason why we haven't seen cryptocurrency uh, adoption for toothpaste or things like that yet. It's still, we're almost in the dial-up internet era. But as we move to broadband and fiber, the equivalent in crypto is moving to proof of stake and sharding, and there's a lot of really interesting computer science problems that are now being uh, worked on to scale blockchains to two, three orders of magnitude, where you could imagine billions of people around the world doing many, many transactions a day on the blockchain for all kinds of things, from you know entering your ID to, to, to enter into an auditorium to paying for food, transportation, rent, to you know, playing games or you know, posting on social media, everything could be done on a blockchain that really scaled. And that's where a lot of this fascinating um, computer science work comes in. I should mention also, by the way, that of course, um, Coinbase is making a big investment in India. We have 300 employees here today and India will have 1,000 by the end of this year. And so we're trying to um, hire many of the best and brightest to come work on some of these challenges. Cool. Uh, uh, so uh, there is also a lot of concern around the world on uh, you know adoption of cryptocurrencies uh, en masse and uh, naturally from from the states the anxieties are how do we regulate it and uh, Subhan do you want to take up questions regarding regulating cryptocurrencies? Um, yes so um, you know so government of India um, wants to regulate. You know, the finance minister has, has declared in her budget speech that we will regulate, we will tax it 30%. Um, we are in a bit of a quandary because um, the Niti Aayog, uh, on your meeting perhaps, they want the two of us to take up a project suggesting how to regulate cryptocurrency. Mm. So um, 
So the question is, you know, uh, if, you, if you look at it, and also also given that, uh, you know, there's this uh, mining proof of work energy consumption, uh, and some participate and some don't, uh, so perhaps taxation is in, is in order. But what kind of a tax? Is it going to be capital gains tax? At what point do you tax it? Uh, if you regulate it, you know, what are the ways to regulate it? Can you, can you, can you throw some light on it? Yeah, so I was very pleased to see that India took a direction of saying, you know, this will be a legal and regulated industry, that it'll be taxed. Um, there's, you know, sometimes the initial fear that uh, people have when they see it is that, hey, this is dangerous, we should ban it. They think it's being used by criminals. The data that is out there is very clear, which is that um, about 1% or less of all crypto transactions are for illicit purposes. And you know, in the United States, cash is 4% is, is for illicit purposes. <laughs> so it's cryptocurrency is actually better than cash. And, it's, and it's, you would never wanna remove a technology from society that 99% of people are using for good purposes and only 1% bad. That's where sensible regulation can come in to mitigate the 1% of bad activity. We, in general, Coinbase is in favor of thoughtful regulation. We wanna work with governments all over the world, including in India, to help that sensible regulation come to fruition. And the way, some of the high level things that we think about in terms of what that would look like. So in terms of taxation, I think that we want cryptocurrency to be treated on par with other assets like um, commodities or stocks. It's, in other words, let's not, penalize it, but don't have, it shouldn't be zero either. You know, if, and I, my understanding by the way is that the 30% tax is like a little bit higher than maybe something equivalent in commodities or security. So in my sense, I'm glad it was not worse, but it, it has a small punitive aspect to it, which is, which was not perfect. Um, aside from that, to my point earlier, cryptocurrency is going to be many different things. It's gonna be a currency, it's going to be a commodity, it's gonna be a security, it's going to be artwork and probably 10 more things that we haven't even thought about. And so trying to have um, just one regulatory agency do all of that is too much. You know, there's typically in most countries, there's one regulatory body that would regulate commodity trading, another for securities, another would regulate sec um, uh, currencies. And so, and usually artwork and things like that are unregulated and gaming and things like that. So. I think that um, basically in most countries there will need to be a framework developed to, to have a test and say what makes this cryptocurrency a commodity versus a security or a currency versus a commodity. And that test, it can, you know, usually this, these are like point systems. You know, if it has this many points, it becomes X and if less than that, it's Y. And that will tell you which agency should regulate it. Um, and then I think this technology can basically be regulated uh, similar to the existing regulations that are there for commodities and securities and financial services. It is, it's a new way to do those things, but um, it shouldn't be penalized. It should be done on a level playing field. And there's just one more thing I would add uh, in terms of thoughtful regulation. I think it's very helpful to create a sandbox environment which is basically for startups to say, if you're, if you're less than X percent revenue or, or rupees in revenue, then you can exist without a license. You know, we want to make it easy for any student with a laptop to build the future. And you know, it's very expensive to go get lawyers and licenses if you're a tiny startup. Companies like Coinbase, we're happy to do that. We have resources. But you don't want to kill startups because India is a, com is a country that is so thoughtful about innovation and technology, and I think there's a general recognition. You know, IIT is an example of that, really, of the investment in the future of the entire economy. A lot of it comes from innovation and technology. And so you wouldn't want to kill startups. You want to encourage startups, but regulate companies as they become big. And uh, those are some of my high-level thoughts. We, we would love to work with any, anybody on that, including yourselves. Yeah. The, the other question, you know, that comes up is when it comes to regulation, the, the thing that worries me is state capacity, you know, especially when a thing as complicated and as diverse as Coinbase comes up, whether there's a state capacity to regulate. And I think that's also bothering the government of India somewhat, you know, that um, to be able to regulate it correctly, they have to understand it first. And, uh, and um, so what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, the 
Cryptocurrency is so new and it's evolving and changing so quickly that I'm very sympathetic to this. I mean, I feel like I barely understand it sometimes because there's, it used to be, you know, five or 10 years ago, every research paper that came out, I could, I could read it and maybe try to understand it. Now there's so many research papers happening in cryptocurrency, I can't possibly read them all. And I hear about something new from my team every day that I'm like, I didn't even know about that. So I, I sympathize. I think that um, Coinbase can be a resource, right? We have enough people on our team now where we're happy to meet with any government around the world or regulator. We want to be an educational resource. We want to be an advisor. We, we're supportive of thoughtful regulation. We, we've even, um, we can help draft things, you know, whatever is necessary and respectful. Um, so we're, our door is open and uh, I want to meet with people. That's part of the reason why I'm here. Uh, just to add uh, to that question, um, and this may be a slightly contentious uh, issue. So there are some sometimes legitimate state aims to do traceability. And um, uh, how would that happen in a cryptocurrency setup? Uh, what are your thoughts on it, if, if there's a way out? Yeah, so this is a common question about um, how will law enforcement track bad actors in crypto? And one of the common misconceptions about crypto is that it's totally anonymous. It turns out that's not really the case. Um, the blockchain itself is actually an open ledger, so you can see every address where the funds went, which is not true of cash. Um, and then additionally, regulated cryptocurrency companies like Coinbase, we work very closely with law enforcement. So we often will get a subpoena, something like that, and they'll say, hey, this, some illicit activity has happened. Um, you know, we collect identifying information on our customers because we're an exchange, we, we follow all the financial services regulations just like a bank or a brokerage would. And so um, if they subpoena us and, and the subpoena is valid, then we turn over that information um, to the government. And so we, we've worked closely with law enforcement in that regard. Um, yeah. Right, thank you. So, uh, so there were a bunch of questions uh, from students on, and I think that we are at uh, towards the end of our first side chat. Uh, so, uh, he, we would like to know um, what are your views on some exciting computer science problems in the areas relating to cryptos, blockchain, cryptocurrencies, smart contracts. Yeah, well, one of the areas that's really exciting is uh, ZK snarks, um, zero knowledge proofs, and I think that's a very interesting area of crypt cryptography research. Um, there's a lot of interesting research happening around scaling blockchains with um, things like sharding and uh, new consensus algorithms like proof of stake. Um, you know, there's a lot of, well, there's a lot of uh, economics research also happening with stable coins and things like that, but that's less computer science related. So yeah, I would say ZK snarks and scaling things with sharding and proof of stake, uh, new consensus algorithms like that, or, and maybe, maybe some formal verification things with smart contracts as well. That's, that's quite exciting. So, uh, you know, one thing that sort of um, worries me a little bit is when it comes to crypto, the research has been more in computer science than in economics, you know, whereas after all it's a currency, it's a, it's a, it's a monetary instrument. So what, what are the kind of things that economists should do about it? Uh, I've been surprised by that too. I thought that we would have seen more economics papers on cryptocurrency now. Yeah, I don't really know why that is. Somebody told me that um, the funding for that typically comes from organizations that are not, they don't, they're not interested in cryptocurrency. I, I don't really know, to be honest. But I do feel like there should be more economics research happening with crypto. So, um, you know, startups. Uh, so you have been talking about startups. And IIT Delhi is known for startups, right? So we have, uh, you know, what are called the uh, Navaratna companies that in several from this institute. So what would your advice to uh, to people who are looking at startups in, in the crypto domain? So. Yeah, well, I, I believe that starting companies is one of the best ways to have a positive impact on the world. Um, not just, you know, later in life, if you earn wealth, of course, there's philanthropic things you can do. But I believe the companies themselves are incredibly positive for the world. And if you want to think about all the biggest challenges in the world today, improving education, climate, um, you know, energy production, to me, these are all things that can be really moved forward with technology. Look at you know, free online education, um, or look at you know, fusion energy research, or 
carbon sequestration. Like to me, these are all engineering and science driven breakthroughs that can happen. And so if you want to have a big impact on the world today, I believe you should study science and technology. You should start companies. Um, one thing that I would just pass along to all of you is that when I was a computer science student, um, I was interested in startups, but I didn't really know if I could be a CEO because I, in my mind, I always thought of CEOs as being these very commanding, extroverted people like military generals or something like that. But I was kind of like, I was more introverted and more shy, you know, maybe today it's hard to tell because I, now I'm a CEO, I give lots of talks, but I'm actually an introverted person. Um, I like to write code, you know, um, I was never, never saw myself as someone who could be very commanding of a big group of people or something like that. But what it turns out is that um, nerds make great CEOs. <laughs> introverted, you know, technical people make great CEOs. I mean, look at now some of the biggest companies in the world are run by nerds. Um, so a lot of them computer science nerds. And so um, I think that there is a lot of value in being a good introvert and an engineer CEO, and that if anybody here wants to do it, I would tell you that you can. Um, these are, you know, it's if you've never met these people, you might think of, you've only read about them in, in news media or online, and you think, oh, they're geniuses or they're evil or whatever, and like, these stories are usually all false. I mean, they're just like regular people just like you or just just like me. I mean, in some ways you're not regular, you're very special people to be admitted to this university, but um, they are regular people in the, in the truest sense of that word. And um, if you have an interest in doing it, then just, just start. And usually the first thing you do will not work. I can tell you, you know, the first, I, I tried probably 10 different startup ideas before um, Coinbase worked and most of them failed. So if you, that's how you learn is you try things and then it, it doesn't work and then you keep doing more and more things and maybe 10 years from now, you'll find the right thing and that's fine, keep, keep going. So Naveen, suppose you heard nerds can also do that. Yeah, so yes, there was a question on if you could talk a bit, a little bit about Coinspace initiatives on, in supporting students, developers, and researchers who wish to learn and work in Web3. I mean, you did say that uh, you're expanding in India, and um, uh, the current workforce is already at 300, but uh, there are more opportunities um, already there, but would there be any internship positions available and so on and so forth? Yeah, so we, we do hire interns, and there's a couple of initiatives that we've done from more of a philanthropic point of view to educate more uh, crypto-forward developers in the world, sponsoring education programs. We've sponsored some open source developers as well who are working on uh, the, the blockchain protocols themselves. Uh, we, we have people inside Coinbase who do that, but we also sponsor some external people who work on that. So if anybody is interested in working or learning in crypto, I would encourage you to apply to Coinbase or other cryptocurrency companies, and it's a really exciting field. I think, to me, it feels like where the internet was in the early 2000s, and um, it's just one of the most exciting spaces, so. Thank you, so. You I think we're done with, uh, with most of the questions, so. Um, um, yes, thank you, thank you, Ryan, I think. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Brian. Um, thank you, Subhashish. Thank you, Subodh. Uh, this was really wonderful. I think um, uh, I'm sure all of you would have really enjoyed learning about um, about cryptocurrency, about Coinbase, about the various, about the vision that Brian has for uh, you know where all of this is going to lead uh, to in the in the years to come. I think um, uh, it. it, it uh, I, to be very honest, you know, I, I, I had most of my knowledge about cryptocurrencies from newspapers, and there seems to be, uh, uh, as Brian also mentioned, cryptocurrency seems to be associated with more, uh, uh, with, with a sense of digital gold. So it looked more like a, a avenue for investment for people who had the money. But uh, what I think I learned today is that uh, it's likely to have a much more impact on our lives and uh, and uh, you know 
and the way we work and live in, in, in the future. So that's, uh, that's wonderful uh, to hear and uh, to know about. Um, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Uh, we have, uh, with that, I think we'll uh, close the session. Um, before uh, we disperse, um, I should like to point out that um, Coinbase has kindly arranged some t-shirts for all the members of the audience, so you should be able to pick them at the, uh, you know, uh, there's a desk at the end of the seminar hall, and please uh, collect your t-shirts. Uh, we would also like to request uh, uh, the uh, and present a small memento to uh, Brian to, uh, for him to remember this conversation. Thank you, and uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you all for joining us.